Well, good afternoon. And I, my name is Kathleen Dudley, and this is an ongoing series on constitutional law with uh, lawyer Ron Gibson. Welcome, Ron. Thank you very kind of Kathleen for having me. Well, it's always a pleasure and I'm just sitting on the edge of my chair, uh, just waiting to listen to what you have to say. And today we're going to talk about land patents and perhaps you could explain in detail what they are and, and also maybe start with why land patents? What is so important about land patents and why is that a passion of yours? Well, simply because with land ownership comes a bundle of rights. And uh, we all talk about our rights. Very few people understand what our rights are, let alone how to defend it. But it goes way back to the time of the Bible that our land ownership right is a God-given right. People think, well, I have land because I paid for it. That's not where the, the principal jurisdiction come from. And if you would allow me, let me read to you, if I may. This is a document that I prepared. It's called Forever. And it's 11 different scriptures in the Bible about God's willingness and desire and implemented plan for us to own land. And if I can read them quickly to you, uh, very profound, I think. It starts with Genesis 13, 15. For all the land which you see, I will give to you and your descendants forever. Exodus 32, 13. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants to whom you swore by yourself and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars in the heaven and this land of which I have spoken, I will give to you and your descendants and they shall inherit it forever. Joshua 14, nine. So Moses swore on that day saying, surely the land of which your foot has trodden will be an inheritance to you and your children forever because you have followed the Lord your God fully. First Chronicles 28, 8. So now in the sight of all of Israel, the assembly of the Lord and in the hearing uh, of our God, observe and seek all of his commandments of this Lord your God so that you may possess the good land and bequeath it to your sons after you forever. Second Chronicles 27. Did you not, O God, drive out the inhabitants of the land before your people Israel and give it to your descendants of Abraham, your friend forever. Ezra 9, 12. So now do not give your daughters to their sons nor take their daughters to your sons and neither seek their peace nor their prosperity that you may be strong and eat of the good things of the land and leave it as inheritance to your sons forever. Psalm 37, 29, the righteous will inherit the land and dwell in it forever. Isaiah 60, 21, then all of the people will be righteous and they will possess the land forever. The branch of my planting and the word of my, the work of my hand that it may be glorified. Turn my page here. In Jeremiah 7, 7, and then I will let you dwell in this place and the land that I give to you and your fathers forever and ever. Jeremiah 25, 5, saying, turn now everyone from his evil ways and turn from evil of your deeds and dwell in the land which the Lord has given you, you and your um, forefathers forever and ever. And Ezekiel 37, 25, they will live in the land that I give to Jacob, my servant, and in which your fathers live, and they will live in it and their sons and their sons and their sons forever. 
and my servant David will be the prince forever. The point that I wanted to share that with you, God puts a pretty high value on land. And because he wants us to own land, he wants us to have land, he wants us to be good stewards of the land, but it all belongs to him anyway. But he has allowed for us to participate in what we call land ownership. Well, our forefathers, if you read your history and go back and research the record, our forefathers knew exactly what I was talking about here because they already knew it way before I did. And that is the fact that they wanted to create a document that so protected the person and the land that nobody could touch it. And they did that. And they did it out of a constitutional mandate, Article 4, Section 3, Clause 2. We call it the in law, the land disposal section of the Constitution. And then the Congress created what was then called the General Land Office, which was given broad discretion about how to implement and how all of the, of the requirements that they uh, were, that the applicant was required of which to get uh, the patent issued in their name. And so that's what they did at the mandate of the Constitution, Article 4, Section 3, Clause 2. And if you read that, it talks about disposing. Disposing means to transfer from one to another, to dispose, to, uh, I'll call it, uh, you end up with clean hands. You don't hold anything anymore in your hand. This here, I'm gonna hold it up, is, is a copy. These are called letter patents, okay? And these letter patents, unless they're a railroad patent or a single page document that I've shown. And in this, this is a certified copy, which is right there where my finger is, but it also has in the embossment here, which shows that that comes from a duly authorized agent or agency of which says that this is the exact copy of the original patent that was issued to the grantee. The government is considered the grantor and the recipient that gets this document is called the grantee. So there were certain requirements that were required for a person to be able to apply and receive a land patent. And when that requirements were done, the United States government was obligated to issue this patent that I'm holding here to the grantee, okay? Now, I'm gonna say something that is very much misunderstood. I just mentioned this is the title, this is the patent, but it's really not the title. What this is, is evidence of your title. Your title is held in law, and created out of law of Article 4, Section 3, Clause 2 of the Constitution. That's why this document cannot be impaired by any government agency, any court, or whatever. Because when this document is created by that of the filling the document out and the requirements are met, it is signed and stamped by the President of the United States on behalf of the representative of the Constitution, that being Article 4, Section 3, Clause 2. This creates a forever contract. That's why I read to you in the forever document, that's where our forefathers got the word forever and placed it in every one of these patent documents, the word forever. Let me read to you what it says that it is hereby granted to the undersigned, to their heirs and assigns forever. That means this document never diminishes. They can't circumvent it. They can't alter it. None of that is allowed by virtue of this constitutional protected document that conveys the land from the United States trust to the people, to the individual. So that's how this thing 
got started. The land ownership issue goes clear back to the Bible. From the Bible, it went and shows up again in the Magna Carta. From the Magna Carta, went to Old English law. From Old English law, came to this country through our forefathers that came from Britain. And then they said, we want to create a mechanism so that even the poor man would never lose his property to speculators, to unlawful legislation, and to unlawful court decree. <coughs> so there was a lot of effort that went into the drafting and the language <coughs> of these land patents. <coughs> Excuse me. And so they did the best that they could. And I have to tell you, they did a miraculous job. These land patents have been tested in the courts for over 180 years and has not less, ever lost at the Supreme Court level. So pretty, pretty important set of documents. Okay. Look, Ron, let me ask you this. So yes. does everyone who buys a piece of property have a land patent? The land patent, in answering your question, I want to digress a moment, okay? I want you to follow me along. When these patents were issued, one of the requirements was that they had to have it recorded in the local county recorder's office, which signified and proved to the public that the, the grantee or the assignee, as it says in the patent, that you are the owner of record, okay? So then Congress unlawfully in 1976, excuse me, 1946, passed a legislative act that is totally unconstitutional. And it's called the Administrative Procedures Act. That whole act is totally unlawful. In doing so, was for the purpose, the primary purpose of taking our land and our rights away from the people, okay? So then in doing so, what they did, there's a maximum in law that's universal. One can only claim jurisdiction over that which one creates, okay? So the government created a new you and they took your exact spelling of your Christian name, upper and lower case, and they put it all in cap letters, claiming that now you are a government subject, that you are now under their ownership and jurisdiction. And that's why your bank account, your driver's license, your ID, your social security all have capital letters in it. And the reason for that is, Nobody really objected. They did not understand what it meant. So ever since 1946, and then also when they did the administrative and also the enactment of the uh, Administrative Procedures Act, we have gone along with it. And any time that government imposes a non-constitutional issue, we're not bound by it. But we do need to rebut it. And now there is an awakening across this land that people are realizing and recognizing something is dreadfully wrong. And so I'm bombarded with calls and emails and requests for my books and, and to do land patents and whatever. And, and I'm thankful because I spent, I'm gonna guess about 35 years so, so to speak, standing on the rooftop, screaming at the top of my lungs, people get your property back into the land then. And there's a lawful procedure to do that, of which I teach how to do it. I do that as a business to help people get reestablished as the true title. The patent, folks, is the only true title to land. What you have if you're a property owner or a so-called owner, is the fact that you have what's called a warranty deed. A warranty deed is not a title. 
the warranty deed conveys no protection of your property whatsoever. Here's what a warranty deed does. It acknowledges that you have an equity interest in a given piece of property and that you have the permission, not right, but the permission to take occupancy, okay? Nothing in that document, that warranty deed, that states or shows or acknowledge that you are an owner of that property. So what you'll find if you go look at your warranty deed, don't take my word for it, you're listed as a tenant. What is a tenant? A tenant is a renter, not an owner. And I keep trying to get that across to people to help them to understand you don't own your property. That's why you have uh, building permits. That's why you have land use restriction. That's why you pay taxes on that, all of that. The land patent was to never be taxed by a property tax. That's called an ad valorem tax. And I wrote a book on that. And I'll show you the books here in a moment, but it's called You're Not a Slave. But the point I'm trying to make here is the fact that the United States Supreme Court has reaffirmed what this land patent says. It doesn't matter whether you're the 50th owner of that property, you can bring your land patent forward by virtue of doing the documents that are required, of which I provide and show people if they want to try to do it themselves. Having said that, I don't recommend that you do the legal documents yourself because it's a legal document and it has to be done correctly. I had a lady four or five years ago, maybe six years ago, demanded that she wanted to do it herself. So I said, okay. So anyway, she did it wrong and she was claiming other people's property uh, along with her own. Well, she got caught at it and they sentenced her to seven years in jail. So I'm saying, I'm saying that this stuff can get pretty serious. So if you want to do your land patent, and I strongly encourage you to do that, let me and my company take care of doing that for you, just so that you don't have a problem with it. The may other I, thing. May I ask you, Ron? Is it yes. a, is it a costly and 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 uh, time involved process? Let's well, there, there 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 is a cost to it, and I have a a coordinator that takes care of that. So I would refer people to get a hold of AmericanMeeting.com and ask for Robert and he can lay out what the, uh, we have several options for people to do. So rather than announce that here, let him, if they're interested, get a hold of Robert through AmericanMeetingGroup.com and he'll fix you up. So uh, the time period of it uh, generally takes, and, and it depends upon uh, if we do the full service, about how long it takes to get the chain of title. That's usually the biggest time consumer there. Once that I get everything to put it together, then you have to post it for 61 days. The law says 60 days, but there's a court ruling after that was established by the general land office that the first day you post, it's not a full day. But in law, a day is full 24 hours. So I tell people to post it. Now, having said that, we've had a considerable problem with a lot of, of uh, uh, county recorders not wanting to record it. And they're required by law to record it. And it's in my book. And by the way, these are the two books that I have written. One of them is what you need to know about land patents. And this one here is that you're not a slave. This book, I prove where you're not obligated to pay property tax, but it's predicated upon bringing your patent forward so that you have lawful standing. If you want to argue not paying taxes and you still have your, your property in a warranty deed, you're blown in the wind because you don't have 
authority and jurisdiction to defend it. Now, I want to get back uh, a, mo a moment, Kathleen, if I may. Please do. The time frame when the Congress unlawfully enacted the uh, Administrative Procedures Act. Here's what they did. As I shared with you, prior to that time, the landowner brought the patent to the recorder's office to be recorded. They recorded that and he got the land patent back. So every time the property before him was sold and bought, sold and bought, this patent accompanied the paperwork that went with that buy sale agreement. So that every possessor of the land also possessed the what? The title or the evidence of the title, but we call it the title. So what happened is when they administered unlawfully the Legislative Act of the Administrative Procedures Act, they then started in on a mission to redefine legal terms. That's unlawful, and that can be proven in the Northwest Mining Association versus Bruce Babbitt and the Department of Interior dated 1997 case. The government cannot redefine legal terms. They are what they are, and it's to be left so that the entire public of the United States, American people, would know what it says and know what it means. But they did it anyway. So here's what they did. After that enactment, the next guy that brought in the patent to be recorded, the county recorders took that patent put it in the back room and issued what we now know as a warranty deed. Oh, wow. Okay. And then they redefined the term. Instead of owning land, now under this, you supposedly occupy real estate. What does real estate de uh, designate? There's a key word in that called state. The state now, because they're holding this patent document in their back room by element of fraud, then in essence that they now own the land. Therefore, as a warranty deed and a tenant, you're subject to all of the rules and regulations and restrictions and no rights. There are no rights. I'm gonna repeat that. There are no rights with a warranty deed. That's why the foreclosure, they can come and take your property. That's why a court decree, they can come and take your property. A tax sale, they come and take your property. There is no defense. This, folks, is the only defense to protect your land that there is. Okay? This is serious stuff, folks. This is very serious. And I could get into the mortgage thing. Those are totally unlawful, every one of them. They don't loan you any money, but that we'll get into that a little later. The other thing that that I want to share with you, let me find it on my paperwork here, because I want to read it to you. I want you folks to write this down. It's called Title 43 USC Section 57 and 83. And I'm going to read you what those two provisions in Title 43 say, Title 43 USC Section 57 establishes that a duly certified copy of the federal land patent, that's this document right here, okay, shall be evidence in all cases where the original would be the evidence. Because this is certified, it acts in law as the original, okay? Now, let's go on. Title 43 USC section 83 covers the evidentiary effect of a certified land patent. Listen to this, for all states, and all courts in the United States must take judicial notice of the federal patent and their evidentiary effect under the federal statutes. All judges in all states 
shall be bound as to the power and the validity of the patent. One of the cases I put in here is United States versus DeBell. So I'm just sharing here with you, boy, that's a powerful document. And uh, <laughs> I want to tell you a little story. I like stories. Good. You know, Jesus taught in parables. He taught uh, a word picture, if you please. And I love that, that process. But I helped five elderly couples get their land patent put together and everything. And uh, so when we got them all done, I said, Friday, I said, go to the county recorder's office in the county where I live and you get them recorded. So I said, be there about nine o'clock. About 10 o'clock, I get all these phone calls, Ron, you got to help, help, help. And I said, what's the matter? Said the county recorder wouldn't record our documents. And I said, why? He said, he didn't say, he just said he had no provision uh, in the Oregon statute of which to allow him to uh, record it. I said, tell you what, all of you meet me at the courthouse the county recorder's office at quarter to nine on Monday morning. I said, I'll be there. So quarter to nine, we met. And I told him, I said, we're all going to go in. And I want you to let me do the, the speaking. Don't, don't anybody say anything. So we go in. Gal comes to the counter. And I said, I'd like to talk to Mr. Uh, Art Harvey. Uh, well, he's busy. I said, ma'am, I don't think you understand. I want to talk to Mr. Harvey. So she went back there reluctantly and, and their offices are solid from the floor up four feet and then they're all glass. So I could see him and her in there talking and pretty soon he turned around and he looked and shook his head. So finally he got up and he moseyed out and he said, how can I help you? And I said, Mr. Harvey, I said, it is my understanding that last Friday, that these folks came in to have their land patent uh, documents recorded and you uh, refused to record them. I said, is that correct? He said, yes. And I said, may I ask you why? <coughs> Excuse me. And he said, yes. He said, there's no provision in the statute he said to record these documents. He wouldn't call it by name. I said, well, sir, I said, I beg, I beg your pardon. Uh, I said, I, I differ with you. I said, are you familiar with ORS uh, 93650 and 93680? And he looked at me like a deer in a headlight. And he said, no. And I leaned forward and I said, I think you should. What that is, is a requirement under Oregon ORSs that you have to record titles. These are titles that these folks are bringing forward. Now, let's go to the federal side of this subject. Let me turn to it here. Okay, I'm in my book on page 127. There's three, four, five pages of law in here that were, they can't do what they do. But let me read this to you. It says, uh, the recording of such patent judgment approval list or deeds recorded or the transcript therefore certified by a county clerk or those which come to the office need to be recorded uh, as evidence in the, any court in this state and like effect of the original document. They're talking about certified copy. Listen to the next one. Failure to do so will result in further charges under the Tweel and Carmain doctrine. Those two, Tweel and Carmain, are court cases that have to do with recordation. And the court kicked their butt on it for fraud and estoppel to prevent you from engagement in the future commerce. 
Now, let me read to you the federal statutes. I read to you the two under the state says The federal statutes, the requirement to record, listen to what I said, the requirement. First of all, let me back up a minute. A recorder's office cannot make determinations of law. They can only administer their job within the law. Do you understand what I'm saying here? Yeah. Huge difference. And that's what they've been doing. They've been administering their own law from an entity that has no lawful authority to do that. Under Title 18, I want you to write this down. Title 18 USC stands for United States Code, Section 2071. That is a requirement under federal statutes of which they have to record your documents. Because it is worthy to be made public for the sake of determining who is the owner of record. And the court case, one of them that I put in the book is Bifle versus Morton Rubber Industries. And that's a Texas case in 1990. And now listen to this next one. An instrument is deemed in law, filed at the time that it is delivered to the clerk, regardless of whether the instrument is file marked. And I tell people that they got, and California is really bad about this, but I tell people to be kind, be cons uh, considerate and courteous, but you let the clerk know that you want to have this. If they absolutely refuse, call for their supervisor, let him know, get my book, take my book with you and read them at that page 127. But if they still refuse, your land patent sandwich that I call it, all of these documents, that lawfully brings your property back in your name, lay it on the counter and walk out the door. Do not pick it up and take it back with you. Now, if you go to the next pages in my book, some very interesting law, Title 18, Section 241, called Conspiracy Against Rights, Title 18, Section 242, Deprivation of Rights Under Law, they can't touch that document to damage it, to destroy it, or throw it in the trash. It's a federal crime, period. So that's how serious this uh, uh, recording issue is. When you go in to record something, always, always take a witness with you. That way you have somebody with you that can do an affidavit of fact. And the very fact that unless it's rebutted item by item, it stands in law after 30 days. So just to let you know where that stands. Okay. I mentioned to you folks earlier about vested rights. Vested rights are also in law which means they cannot be altered, they can't be taken away, they cannot be diminished. All of the protective covenants of that land patent and the bundle of rights that a person gets when you bring your land patent forward is the same as the original grantee when the patent was issued. None of that is ever diminished because the patent is forever. Now I'm looking at my watch and forever isn't up yet, okay? So the doctrine of vested rights is applied in constitutional law, protects a person's right and or property who won a legal decision from a legislative, gives a whole list of stuff, McCulloch versus Virginia, et cetera. Legislation may act on subsequent proceeding, uh, but may abide a, a proceedings that does not infringe upon vested rights. The doctrine of vested right also protracted property owners and its use and its development. Did you get that? So when you go to the county planning department, say, I want to build a house, I want to build a garage, I want to build a shop, 
And they said, no, you can't do that. You can only do one dwelling. You just say, hey, wait a minute. We got a problem here, or you have a problem. And that is my best of rights protects my property. When you have a land patent, I keep going back to this. You are king of your land. Okay? You're king of your land. Because these patents, and I haven't mentioned it yet, are allodial titles. They're allodial patents. A-L-L-O-D-I-A-L. -L -L. Let me give you the definition of allodial. Means owing to no one, nor to any lord, nor superior. I don't know about you folks, that means but I'm the boss. I'm the owner. I'm the one that says yay or nay. Okay. So that's uh, pretty important. Also, one of the protective covenants uh, is found in Article 1, Section 10, Clause 1. And there are three elements that the federal constitution forbids states from doing or enacting. Number one, they are forbidden, it's called estoppel, uh, from implementing any kind of a bill of attainder. And you say, well, Ron, what's a bill of attainder? Let me read you the definition of a bill of attainder. A bill of attainder is defi defined to be a legislative act, which, listen carefully, inflicts punishment without a judicial trial. Judges then assume a judicial uh, position of a judicial magistrate and pronounces guilt on the party without any forms of safeguards of a trial and then fixes the punishment. There's a whole bunch of case law on that. That's what a bill of attainder is. Now, let's give an example of that. What about a tax sale? What do they do in a tax sale? They claim you own three or four years to back taxes. Now they're going to come and take your, your property. They do a notice of sale into the paper. They list the date, the property that's going to be sold. <coughs> and they commission the sheriff to come and conduct the sale. Where is your protection? of that property. You don't get to go before a jury. You don't get to argue your case. All of that is shoved aside and they just come and take it. Now that's unlawful for a number of reasons. Number one, it's fraud in the first, or attempt to commit fraud in the first instance, and it's an unlawful fraud in the second instance. I wanna read you something. I'm digressing here a little bit. This is a letter from the governor of Texas, okay? And a, let me read it to you. State of Texas, Office of the Governor, Austin, Texas, dated September 10, 1992. Thank you for le your letter regarding school financing. This issue had to do with taxes being applied to schools or for school. We have uh, a process needed in Texas to find a, a permanent solution to the question of financing our public educational system. As you may know, on January 30th, 1992, the Texas State Supreme Court rule in SB 351 unconstitutional, saying that the County Educational District, CED, do not have the power to collect property taxes. Hello. The court has given the state of Texas two years, designed a new system for funding public education. According to the ruling of the court, the CED will be able to collect taxes for the next two years and allow them to fund the education until a new plan is derived. In this ruling, the court stated that the collection of CD taxes must continue in order to guarantee, and I mentioned that, that the education will continue on 
until they find a new way of which to fund it. So the point I'm bringing this up, patents were to never be taxed. Real estate can be taxed, but land patents cannot. Okay, now the second item in Article 1, Section 10, Clause 1 is called No State Can Legislate a Bill of Attainder. Now you say, well, Ron, what's a bill of attainder mean? Well, I'd love to share with you what it is. A bill of attainder is a legislative act or a policy and or procedure that, that strips you of your right and makes it now an issue of permission and cost. <coughs> In other words, you had a right yesterday and the legislator passes an enactment today that wipes out, according to them, that right. Ron, may I interrupt you for one moment? Yes. Does this go back to 1946 as well with um, the Congress uh, Administration Act? Or is yeah, this- Yeah, 1946, that's so, correct. So, so all of this, basically, um, this, this, this fraud that was that was um, perpetrated upon us. And Every bit of it, Kathleen, is fraud. Everything to do with the Administrative Procedures Act is fraud. We have elections on the basis of the Administrative Procedures Act. We have every state in the union has passed some type of legislative issue or court decree. Even the court decrees are fraud based upon the Administrative Procedures Act. You're absolutely correct. It's fraud, folks, wake up. It's fraud. Well, that, that's a, you know, kind of puts a real um, knot in my, in my stomach as I'm listening to all of this. And, and I, my mind is racing as I, I think about all of what I must do to get my own paperwork in order so that this perpetration against me, against all of us, is stopped. <clears throat> that is correct. That's why, Kathleen, I've been screaming from the rooftop for years that people don't understand what I just said for the most part. And I try to explain it in a way that's clear so they can grasp the point. And I'm not pointing fingers at, at, at the public out here at all. Sure. I'm just saying they've never been exposed to this. I'm one of the few, not the only one, but one of the few that comes and tells the truth. And uh, I've been severely criticized uh, for doing just that. But my Bible says you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. And I'm a firm believer in that. Well, here, here. And, and so one more thing, you, you talk about how we then basically become a commodity uh, under the uh, US, cons uh, US government corporation from birth and our names are in capital letters, can we still, even if we haven't gone through the process of removing ourselves from that jurisdiction, can we still get our land patent work done? Well, it's absolutely critical if we're gonna get out from underneath this tyrannical government. First of all, I want to clarify, it's not a government. It's a corporation portraying and acting and claiming that they are a government. And unless you're a government employee or a corporate employee, we're not even bound by that stuff anyway. You know, and the thing that really has troubled me uh, when this uh, COVID-19 thing came, they scared the American public and around the world for that, that, oh my gosh, you better... You, you know, you better put this mask on. You better stay six feet away and on and on. So a whole other subject. So the point that I'm trying to make here is like you mentioned, Kathleen, the whole system of which we are living in our day and since 1946 is nothing but a fraud. It's an absolute fraud. Now I wanna go back to something uh, well, let me finish this first. Uh, so now I've shared with you what a bill of attainder is. I've shared with you what an ex post facto is. In other words, it's an unlawful means to strip you of your rights, basically is what an ex post facto. The third item 
is tremendously critical that no legislative act can impair the obligation of contract. Now, this document that I have shown you time and time again today is a forever contract. Remember I said that earlier? As a result of that contract and all the protective covenants, what agency or what court or what legislative body has the right to infringe upon that patent? Last time I looked in my math class, uh, zero is zero, still zero. Nothing is still nothing, okay? So, but anyway, that's kind of how that works uh, because it's a lodial title. The other thing that the patents are protected by treaty law. There's no court in the land can undo a treaty because the land were acquired under various treaties then in essence, that protective covenant that the treaty brings, the land belongs to we the people. People think that this out west here, all the land that's not owned privately belongs to the government. And I can tell you that's an absolute fallacy. That's another fraud. Every land law ever made is under a public land law designation. Now, here's another issue that was done in 19... 76 is called the FLIPMA, the, M, the enactment of the Federal Land Policy Management Act. And in that act, we, we better know it as FLIPMA, uh, they, the United States Congress claimed that they had authority to reclaim all of the public lands into their possession. Hello, my question is this, how do you reclaim something you never owned to start with? And even to this day, every enactment is done under a public land law designation. So this fraud, further fraud that you mentioned is so far and wide that it's scary. It is, it's infiltrated in every aspect of our life. So, all I'm saying to you folks is that lots of stuff being pulled shenanigans behind their back. And another thing that I want to mention here very quickly, government does not, the administrative so-called government, does not function on the basis of law. They do not function on the basis of right and wrong. They do not function on the basis of any moral code. They do not function on any kind of fairness. The Administrative Procedures Act enacted an implication of brute force. If you don't like what they're doing, then they're going to try to force you to like it. No administrative court has the authority to fine you or to put you in prison. Did you catch that? No administrative court has the authority to do that. Number one is because they don't have judicial authority. And number two is the fact that unless you're uh, employed or under contract to this administrative agency, they have no jurisdiction over you. Had a call this morning from a lady from Maryland who's in a court case and she's struggling like heck and the court just totally ignores her. Uh, she challenged her eviction. It's required by the court rules and by law that when you challenge jurisdiction, that they have to establish whether that is the proper jurisdiction on the record. These administrative courts are not on the record. So how can they court deny her a motion to dismiss on the basis that they just want to ignore the challenge to jurisdiction? There's no provision for them to ignore it. In fact, it's required by law to do so. So anyway, uh, I just wanted to bring that part up. Yes, Kathleen. So oh, are you saying that if you, um, <laughs> bless you, uh, to the courts, a notice to dismiss by law, they have to? They're supposed to, yes, by law. Because so you're, here, let me mention something real quick. When the jurisdiction is ignored, 
Now they have violated your due process right because they haven't established the fact that they have a right to heal the case, nor have they established the right to rule upon a case because of the enactment of your rebuttal, if you please, uh, their claim of jurisdiction. Now, a lot of courts will say, well, we're just going to take jurisdiction. That is so unlawful, I can't even tell you how bad that is because they don't have that authority. So, so what I'm gleaning is that every single step of the process that they consider the legal process is like a, a it's it's like a um, it's a big lie. It's a it's like a shell game. It's nothing is real. They present what they want to do, and if we do not understand our lawful rights, then we fall right into the middle of it and we're just pulled around and and treated like the slave by the oppressor. Kathleen, here's the problem that we Americans have. We stand on the basis of our rights and from the administrative procedures position, we have no rights. You, you, you see the oil and water here? Yes. So we go into court, we claim our rights, we set our jurisdiction, we- They don't even recognize those rights. They okay. don't want to admit that we have rights. That's the reason why the federal courts and the state courts have no jurisdiction over this patent, is because this is a constitutional issue. It's a constitutional product. It comes with constitutional authority and it comes with treaty authority to protect it, as well as all the other protected covenants. <laughs> so the very fact that here we are trying to, to make an argument in a court, they don't wanna hear. I've heard judges say, many people have told me, I don't wanna hear anything about the constitution because it's not considered to be any part of an administrative authority, the constitution. That's for all you constitutionalists out there and all you sovereigns and all of you rednecks and whatever other term you want to put on it. I heard, that, I heard that just uh, this last month when I was in court and I presented my case based upon the constitution and they said, we, we're not interested in that. And then they continued to make fun of my statements and my references to the constitution throughout the throughout the two day trial having to do with an easement issue. And, you know, I, I was prepared somewhat, but I was surprised that they made such fun of the supreme law of the land. Well, what you see, you have just validate the point that I'm making. And that is the fact that when the judge does that, the prosecutor does that, that's a, an act of treason against the constitution of the United States. That's punishable by death. I mean, read it for yourself. That isn't just Ron talking. And so you're right. Everything that we deal with on a daily basis is predicated upon a fraud and a lie because government does not function by laws. And as I mentioned, rules and regulations, they, they function by presumption. Did you catch that? They function by presumption. They presume that you're a slave. They presume that you have no right. They presume that they own you. They presume that your property is not yours anymore, it's there. And on and on and on it goes. Thank <coughs> you. So Ron, in other words, it's up to us to take action, to change our jurisdiction so that we then um, have the documentation that takes us out of their jurisdiction entirely and they can't touch us any longer. But Boy, Kathleen, you have nailed it right on the head. <clears throat> we have a terrible habit in our country <clears throat> that we have practice and an expectation somebody else fix my problem. Somebody else stand up for me and my rights. And therefore, that element of complacency 
is a killer. And you hit the nail on the head. Every person in America needs to stand up and say, you're not step. It's kind of like I shared, I think, last two weeks ago. The definition of a democracy is two wolves and a baby lamb voting on what I have to lunch. And the definition of a republic is the same two wolves and the same lamb, the lamb that has his weapons and you're not having me for lunch today, tomorrow, or ever. That's the difference. But you have to take a stand to protect you and your home and your family, whatever the case is. And for the betterment of society, society as a whole will crumble. And we're seeing our society crumble because the old saying, the best way for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. And we've had a lot of butt sitters, I'll use the term, uh, you know, sitting on our hind end. Uh, we need to rise up, look up, rise up, and take a stand. And one thing, I don't know if I mentioned it two weeks ago, but I teach money, uh, money law, and we'd had trouble with the sheriff deputies giving citations for a granted right by Congress called HR 365. And so I called one of the commissioners that I knew and asked her, I said, can you arrange a meeting so that they will instruct the sheriff's department not to be bothering the minors for doing what they're allowed to do by act of Congress. So anyway, she said yes. And the day we were to meet with her, she came out of the courthouse and came down and greeted us. And she said, we're getting ready to go in. So she turned around and I started following her. I was met 15, 18 people with me. And she stopped dead in her track, turned around, put her hand right on the upper part of my chest and said, hold on a minute. And she's still holding her hand there. And she said, I need to tell you guys something. And I said, what's that? Still holding her hand on the upper part of my chest, she turned and pointed from one end of that courthouse to the other. And she said, everybody in that courthouse is scared to death of you minors. And I mean, you could have knocked me over with a feather. And I said, why? She bent over, still holding her hand on my chest. She said, because they know that you guys know the law. And, and, and I say that for a reason, folks. When you don't have to learn all there is to know about law, but get in just to the basis, turn that television off for a while, get to your computer or the law library or whatever, and just look at the basis. If you need help, contact somebody. But I'm telling you, when you know a little bit of the law, that scares those people plumb to death because it's the absolute hammer that will nail them and they know it. So anyway. Well, that, that's that's very true. When I, when I first moved to New Mexico, I had gone to some county commission meetings and I was sitting next to this one gentleman and I noticed that he was going to all the meetings and I, I turned to him and I said, so what's the key here? And he said, well, when you understand the law, you really can um, um, make a difference in your own life and in other people's. And at that time, I, well, that was quite a few decades ago. And, and well, well, that's, that's the point, isn't it? Understand the law. Until the American people take a stand, we're going to be putting up with more of this, only it's going to get worse. And that's why there's such a push now. There is an awakening, and I thank God for that, of people in this nation. They've known all along, but they didn't want to kind of, you know, shrug their shoulders and act like the problem is going to go away. But this last election really opened a lot of people's eyes about the in-depth and the magnitude of the corruption. And the question that we have to ask, do we want to continue with that? Or are we going to do something to put a stop to it? Because our children and their children and their children, lives and country and freedom is at stake. That's the bottom line, folks. That's right. That's the bottom line. So Ron, in, in conclusion, could you give um, kind of a a bit of a summary of, of action points of how do people at this point, what, what would be like step one, step two, 
step three, step four, and and sources. And um, I know you 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 could also give your website, and I know you have a lot of videos, and including your books, which I will put below in in this interview. Um, but could you maybe do a, a, a brief summary so that we can go, okay, I've, I've done action point one and, and a check mark, and then I'll do two. And then when I complete that, I can give a check mark. And that way we can become empowered and, and, and work toward our freedom for our children and ourselves. You know, Kathleen, that's a wonderful question. But I'm gonna say something that may kind of drew draw people back a moment. The first thing to do, the number one, you gotta make a decision. Every person has to make a decision. Am I gonna be continue to be part of the problem or am I gonna be part of the solution? It isn't until we make an independent decision to do something to correct it. You don't have to know it all to make that decision. That's something that God puts in our heart called our conscience or gut feeling or whatever you want to define it as. But you need to make a decision that yes, the second step is to get together. There are assemblies, state assemblies all over the United States now. There's a good place to draw a tremendous amount of resources of which they're trying to get back to a constitutional republic and a tremendous amount of information within these assembly groups. So I would strongly recommend <coughs> me, that you take that step because from there, then there are people can give you assignments or something that they want you to research or whatever. And it's a learning curve, folks. And it's going to take you a little bit of time, but that's all right. You couldn't absorb it and utilize it if it will all dumped on you at one time anyway. So it's really important to, you know, like going into to the ocean, you want to get your feet wet first before you dive in. And it's the same principle here. But in doing so, because of that information, Jesus looked at Jerusalem and he wept. And he said, my people perish for the lack of knowledge. Okay? The United States is de being destroyed because of the people of the lack of knowledge. That's why I do what I do, but I'm only one person. And I have people when I do speaking engagements or respond to people that watch your program, Kathleen, and they say, well, what can I do? I'm only one, but my immediate response, but you are one and you and I are two, the next person three. And you see where I'm going with that. This has to be built on the basis of a foundational movement because you can't start, start at the top. You get ignored, you get run over, you get slandered, you know, uh, all of that stuff. But a mass of people across this nation scares those people to death. Just like Sandy Castanelli told me they're in front of the courthouse. So uh, from that point, there'll be different things that will come up. One of the things that needs to be a goal is to force your county commissioners or county supervised, whatever they're called in your particular state, that you have to dispose of the corporate standing of the corporation for the county. Because otherwise that's the rattlesnake that's biting you and poisoning you because it's all predicated upon the Administrative uh, Procedures Act and procedures and implications and policies and on and on and on. So, We've put tremendous pressure on our counties here uh, to local ones. We're working our way up the state of which to force them to do the same thing. And, and it's gaining traction. We've had to educate the county commissioners. They didn't have a clue what we were talking about, but we got some sharp people that came into the group and, and said, hey, I can do this. And they was able, I can do that. Because let me tell you something, folks, every one of you, and I want you to listen to me carefully, every one of you can bring something to the table that's a benefit. And boy, if you think you can't, there's an old saying, if you say you can, or if you say you cannot, 
either way you're right. So what's your decision? Are you going to contribute or are you going to be the have to continue part of the problem? Very good. I, um, I think I know um, everyone can find their state assemblies by um, searching that on the search engine. And, um, and as, as you said, Ron, that's just a tremendous wealth of information and it, it, one can begin the, the process. Would you, would you say that the land patent process is something that can be done at any point in time or do you have to go through uh, some of the more basic uh, processes first? No, it can be done at any time, uh, as long as you can show that you're an owner of record. What that is, that you've got a warranty deed that when you bought the property, is stamped by the county recorder's office. Okay. The rest of it is just mechanics to bring that forward. <laughs> Very good. Well, a powerful presentation, and I really appreciate all of what you've shared with us today. And We'll continue, we'll build on this and go into the next uh, next issue of, uh, of, your, of your passion uh, around constitutional law. So thank you very much for the time today. Can I share one more thing quickly? Oh, Kevin? of course, please do. I have here in my hand a copy of a court case called Summa Corporation versus State of California Coastal Commission. It's a... <clears throat> 1984 case, very interesting case. And why I'm bringing it up because it relates back to the power of this patent. This is a patent case, one of many. But anyway, the state of California decided that they were gonna take Sumo Corporation land between West Los Angeles and the beach, the Pacific Ocean. And uh, Summa Corporation said, no, you're not. So anyway, they went to the, the Superior Court of California. And they ruled against Summa. And then they went to the Appeals Court in California. And they ruled against them. Went to the California Supreme Court. They ruled against them. And they didn't have to do all these steps. But I'm just sharing with you what they went through. It's very interesting. They went then to the federal district court. The federal district court ruled against them. Went to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, and the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled against them. Yes, them. So they petitioned the United States Supreme Court, where this should have gone to start with, because it's a constitutional issue. All these lower courts can't rule on this patent. They have no authority to rule because it has to be an Article Three court because it, the issue of the patent is issued out of an article three jurisdiction, okay? So anyway, they get into the court hearing and California argued that they had a right to eminent domain of which to come and claim that property. And the Supreme Court said, no, you don't. Eminent domain doesn't affect land patents. And they said, besides that, this is protected by treaty law. Some of the things that I mentioned kind of condensed in this case. And that's the Guadalupe Hidalgo Treaty with Mexico and the United States. And so then the, the Supreme Court made a very interesting statement. He said for the state of California to have privity, privity means lawful standing to enter into a case, that the state of California had to be named right there had to be named on the original patent. Are you with me? Yeah. The only one that has jurisdiction is the named party that's on the patent. A third party to come on later on in time and said, well, I'm just going to take your land and I'm going to, you know, by whatever means, good or bad. The Supreme Court said, no, you don't. Said, you're not named on that land patent. Wow. So why I say this, I've helped people of code enforcement people and court action to take their patent and say, Your Honor or code enforcement, where are you listed on my patent? Okay. And 
I represented a couple in court case and I asked the administrative or not judges or administrators. I said, where would you please provide the authority that supersedes the Thompson's patent? And the administrator ignores me. So I raised my voice a little bit and I said, sir, I said, I want you to prov provide to me on behalf of the Thompson's a superior title to their land bed. Looked around the room. I said, sir, I'm addressing you that where is the superior title? Does the county have a superior title? And then he got ticked off because I kept poking him with my question. And he said, no. And I said, then what are we doing here? What are we doing here? You have no standing. The county has no standing. They have no privity. This patent is protected by treaty law. I want to see your authority to supersede the Constitution and the treaty and all the protective covenants. Would you please provide those? End of story. Wow. That's understanding the law, Ron. But I just want to encourage all of you get involved because if you don't, we're going to lose it. The intent for you to lose your rights, your property, and your dignity and your honor, all of that. So there are a lot of things going on now that everybody is well aware of uh, to prove that fact. So I thank you all for allowing me to share some of what I have to share here today. Uh, got a lot I can share it over the course of time if Kathleen wants me to be a party of it. I certainly do. And I want to thank you again for sharing all of your knowledge on this and um, <laughs> and the guidance and uh, and and the the urgency that you express for all of us to take action now. Or I'm going to be looking for people to stand up and to speak up. I'm looking for you folks. Where are you? Let's, let's, let's do this together. Because there's a lot of people who want to help. There are a lot of people who want to do. You're not standing there naked, if I can use the term, so to speak. There are a lot of people have the same concern and want to do something. They just don't know what to do. That's where we can help. <laughs> OK, folks, so contact your state assemblies and um, begin to learn what it is about and find out, could you give the uh, land, could you give the website again, the contact for- um, uh, Patent? Yes. Yes, it's AmericanMeetingGroup.com and ask for Robert. Very fine. Well, I'm sure he'll be deluged. Yeah, it, Robert's good people. Very good. Uh, so anyway, I'd like to encourage people, if you're interested in any of my books, uh, get a hold of me. So. And, and get your address, please. OK, my address is Ron Gibson. And my address is 11 North. That's an N with a period. Peach Street, like a fruit you pick off a tree. Medford, Oregon, 97501. So the price of the books are $45 each, includes the shipping. So you need to get into this stuff, folks. This book is loaded, both of them, with case law, page after page after page from start to finish. So anyway, thank you, Kathleen. Thank you very much. Until our next interview, Ron, thank you. Have a lovely. You bet. Thank you. Thank you, folks.